Jesus Christ. As we mentioned in the beginning of Mass, today is known as Gaudete Sunday, the Sunday of joy. Rose is replaced, replaced the violet vestments to show us that we're very near to the celebration of the Lord's Nativity. In fact, starting tomorrow is the day that we call the beginning of the great O Antiphons. Actually, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the hymn we sang in the beginning, is based on those ancient antiphons that will lead the nine days up until the Lord's Nativity. And the readings of today all speak of joy in one way or another. Certainly the prophet Zephaniah brings it out. With daughter of Zion rejoice, the Lord is in your midst. And of course Zion, we know, is the church, that God is with us. The Gospel of Luke, not Matthew as you heard in the beginning, <laughs> but Luke, in many ways picks up that same theme because not only is John calling them to repentance, but in this particular version, he's telling them what to do to be changed, to be converted. And it says at the end, and in many other ways, he preached to the people the good news, which is great joy. Remember, the angels sang that at the birth of Christ. I bring you good news of great joy. But the second reading of today, Philippians, perhaps is the one that we should ponder. Because it summarizes the joy and the message of these readings and today. In the simple words that St. Paul wrote to the Philippians, dismiss all anxiety, rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say it, rejoice. Now, are there anxieties? Always. So Paul isn't being naive in saying dismiss them completely. Really what he's saying is handle them as you would a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus. I read a report the other day that from 10 p.m. on Christmas Eve, throughout all of Christmas Day, is the greatest time in the United States for people to have heart attacks. You would think that would be the least time, surrounded with family and friends, and yet sadness, stress, depression, is a great part of this season as well. Because we speak of such joy and we hear songs of great, that bring forth great emotion, well, in another way, it brings about sadness. You know, we have all these things about being politically correct. One day, the other day, someone told me that there's a, a ban on singing uh, I'll Be Home for Christmas because it's offensive to the homeless. <laughs> Uh-oh. No matter what we say, we get in trouble, don't we? But you know, it's true. Many of us, you know, can feel the pangs of loved ones we've lost. We remember Christmases with them and preparing for Christmas. Parents, siblings, children. Others are in anxiety because their children have wandered away from them or from the church. Others are just lonely. Loneliness is the, one of the greatest diseases. Feeling unloved, uncared for, not appreciated. My goodness, it can be right in the center of a marriage. Stress because the pressures of too many obligations at Christmas time, spending too much money, trying to 
keep up with others. There's lots of factors that come into this moment of realizing the stress and the sadness. Realizing that there's so many people out there that are unhappy, broken marriages, broken families, children separated from their parents, realizing that there are many homeless, many displaced people, that this Christmas will be miserable for them. But it's a reminder of us that in the midst of recognizing these times of sadness or anxiety, that we are not here to celebrate ourselves, but to celebrate Jesus Christ. That no matter what we find ourselves in, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, that the nativity of Christ still goes on. Because it is a celebration of the light that overcomes the darkness. But it doesn't mean the darkness isn't there. Reminiscing earlier this morning about what people go through and how to handle it, I was thinking of, of just the, well, it'll be two years in February, that I lost my only brother. And we were in the funeral parlor and gathered on the vigil before the funeral. And of course, if my brother wasn't dead, I would have killed him because he died in February in northeastern Pennsylvania. Please. You know. There was a blizzard outside. The snow and the ice were all over the place. I believe that night it went down to 13 degrees or 11, something like that. And we were in Corcoran's funeral parlor. That's what John Corcoran likes to call it, but I reminded him of his roots. Oh, for heaven's sakes, John, I said, we always called it Corcoran's corpse house. You're getting awful fancy here, you know. He wasn't impressed. But it's a big old home. It's not one of those sterilized places where they wake bodies. And it was somewhat of a typical my culture wake. Everybody crying and laughing and telling jokes and telling stories. And when it came time for the little vigil service that we had, I was seated close to the feet of my brother. And with the snow whipping outside in the dark, you know, maybe people would have thought that was eerie with the wind blowing in the funeral parlor. But I had a flashback and I shared it with them. Many years before that, many, many years before that, not too many streets away from there, uh, we had a Christmas that I'll never forget. Nor did my brother ever forget. We often spoke of it. Both of us were in the same bed up in the back bedroom with our, our nanny or our nurse or our babysitter, whatever you want to call her. She was a neighbor, Mary Rose Loftus. She was about 20 years old. I was too little to pronounce Mary Rose, so I always called her Roro. And when I mentioned that in my little story in the funeral parlor, John said, oh, she became our babysitter and nanny after you. And we always wonder where Roro came from. But that's what we called her. But she was there telling us that Santa Claus was coming. She said, don't you hear the his hooves on the roof? And of course we did. <laughs> And we heard bells ringing. And then she said, let me see if he's come yet. And she snuck down the stairs and came back. She said, nope, not there yet. She had gotten the unclear sign from my parents. 
And finally, she said, he's here. And we went downstairs. And my parents were smiling because they had just seen Santa. And uh, he left us. You know, I can still remember the tree and some of the toys, the big red car that I got. But as I sat there in the funeral parlor, remembering that other winter night, and obviously, as I tell it to you today, it could bring great sadness. But then I remember the words of St. Paul. Dismiss that anxiety, those sadness. Because in many ways, it's a memory that I'll treasure, always, until I join my brother and the others. And I'm sure my brother right now is enjoying talking to Santa Claus. And it's a wonderful thing to know that God has blessed us with these memories. And rather than allow them to bring us to a crucifixion, to bring us to a moment of great sorrow, let us read true spirit of disciples of Jesus, who thank God always and everywhere and always for all things. Is that not what we sing at the preface? It is right and just, always and everywhere, that we give you thanks, Almighty God. That's what the word Eucharist means, thanksgiving. So in the midst of stress or anxiety, in the midst of sadness, in the midst of feeling the pangs of the human condition, let us never forget to rejoice. Because truly, because of Christmas, because Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead, as the prophet Zephaniah says, rejoice, for the Lord is in your midst.